Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. Maya Angelou once said, you can't really know where you're going until you know where you've been. This affirmation for historical knowledge is apropos for our guest today, especially when others are trying to rewrite history. Dr. Walter Milton Jr., founder and CEO of BH365, and Dr. Joel Freeman, co-founder and executive director of BH365, will discuss their project and new book, Black History 365, an inclusive account of American history. We'll discuss this and more when we return. Never before in America's history has there been a more desperate need for a unified voice to fight against the moral decay of our nation. Liberal progressives are pushing an agenda to destroy Judeo-Christian values and mainstream media and other institutions are promoting the depravity of our nation. At Freedom's Journal Institute, we stand with those who are becoming marginalized simply because of their biblical faith and values. Like you, we are troubled by the racial and political unrest in our society. With the launch of our new online community, the Alliance of Freedom Fighters, we have risen to the challenge in the battle for life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. When you join our community, you will get access to FJI's digital libraries and information sharing portals, the ability to collaborate with other Alliance Freedom Fighters on both national and local community projects and issues, as well as needed support, encouragement, and best practices to champion our shared ideas and values. Go to allianceoffreedomfighters.com and become a part of the Alliance. Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. Today, we're privileged to have Dr. Joel Freeman and Dr. Uh, Walter Milton Jr. with us today. Uh, how are you guys, how are you gentlemen doing today? Doing very well, thank you. Before we get started, talk about the, uh, the short little book that you guys put together. Uh, <laughs> and that's tongue in cheek, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit to you know, tell our audience a little bit about yourselves and your background, just a little bit, because I know Dr. Freeman can go on and on and on. I'm a uh, business owner, um, former school superintendent. Uh, I was superintendent in three states, uh, the state of New York, Michigan, and Illinois. Um, I consider myself a lifetime educator, uh, truly honored to have this opportunity to talk about this most important conversation. And um, glad to have with me um, my co-author, um, Joel, Dr. Joel Freeman, and we look forward to a great show. Okay, Dr. Freeman. Yeah, it's good to be here, Eric, and, uh, and Walter, it's good to see you on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> he lives in Texas, I live in Maryland, so uh, we, this is how we uh, connect many times. But um, yeah, I, I uh, spent a number of years, I'm originally from Alberta, Canada, spent a number of years, about 20 seasons as chaplain for the Washington Bullets, the Wizards in the NBA survived six coaching changes and uh, have been uh, living here in Maryland now for, oh my goodness, um, huh, I think about that, <laughs> a number of decades. And we love it here in the uh, Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. My wife, Shirley, and our four children live in the region. And uh, we have, um, we, uh, both of us, my wife and I, have put together a Black History collection of over 3,000 pieces that we can talk about later if you'd like. But uh, that's been part of our journey. Of course, we're here to talk about, or at least one of the things that you want to talk about is Black History 365, an inclusive account of American history. So what made you decide to take on this project? After being a superintendent for 13 uh, plus years, I knew, noticed that there was a major gap in student achievement. And oftentimes, uh, many students, particularly uh, Black children, are, they walk away with an experience that's kind of void to them in terms of they really can't find connectivity to the educational process. Because oftentimes, especially in history and social studies, um, black history is void, the topic is void. And sometimes they may have to wait until they get to page 275, 300 to see that uh, they existed in the world, but they 
uh, start the conversation as slaves. So what we wanted to do was really highlight the great accomplishments that many um, people of African descent have made, um, not only across the country, but the globe. And so I thought about this and decided to embark upon this journey. And I called uh, Dr. Joel Freeman and said, hey, would you like to be a part of this with me? Um, he agreed, um, he complied, and we have been at it nonstop. Um, it took us about two and a half years of long days, 12 hours, 16 hour days to do the research, extensive research, talking until two and three in the morning, putting this together, going back and forth, uh, looking at all of our sources. And here we are, here we are with an incredible uh, textbook, something that has never been completed at this level in the history of this great nation. Dr. Freeman, you wanna add anything to that? Yes, um, you know, I, I call Walter the uh, trailblazer, the, the keeper of the razor's edge. We came up with the term truth centric. And uh, that's, uh, he's the one that has helped to keep that uh, on, on the razor's edge. But uh, when Walter called me, uh, I felt like, my goodness, this is, this is just something I didn't have to think about. And I said, sure, let's do this. A little did I realize how, how what an arduous up and down all around task this would be to put something like this together. Just to give you an idea, uh, in, in a book that's 1,248 pages, there are uh, 2,567 images. And 525, one-fifth, one out of every five images is from our uh, uh, Freeman Institute Black History Collection. So it's uh, it's just been an incredible journey trying to pull everything together and, and make it uh, something that is, um, uh, that reaches and connects. Uh, we, we like to use the term engages all ages. And we're very blessed and very grateful for the opportunity to, to uh, release this to the world. How do you see this, this book being used? What was your design? Is it just for the classroom or is it something people can buy and use at home? Or how, how do you see this book being used? Let me give you this uh, uh, kind of a look at the book. Uh, <laughs> so this gives you a feel for how thick it is. It's about two and a half inches thick. And just, uh, it's hard to even open anywhere and not find some images uh, that, that we have in the book. Mm -hmm. Our desire, uh, as I mentioned, it engages all ages, is first of all, a primary purpose because we had to meet all the TEAK standards of Texas and all the educational uh, meet and exceed all educational standards of all 50 states. And uh, so we created two editions. One is for Texas because we had to tip the 10 gallon hat to Texas because they had uh, th their, their state board had unanimously voted that every school in the state of Texas has to teach black history. And, uh, be, and so we wanted to have an edition, especially for Texas. And we call that the Lone Star edition. And then one for the rest of the country, we call the 50 stars edition where we uh, uh, give insight into every single state in the union and, and then provide an opportunity for the students to go deeper in their particular uh, lo location in that state. So our purpose is we, we just want everyone to uh, experience it. And when people receive it, one person said that they, uh, they thought it was like, att like attending a virtual black history museum. With all the interaction with the images and the QR codes and everything else. Uh, one of the, the printers at the printing plant, uh, he'd been there for uh, probably uh, 15, 20 years or so. And uh, he, he said that when he showed up that morning, he looked at the job and he thought it was a National Geographic job. And that, we took that to heart, like, wow, this, this is really something that uh, can engage and connect with so many different people at different levels. And white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, Indian, all anyone, everyone, I believe will get something out of this. Dr. Milton? Yes, um, um, a phrase that we coined is that it engages all ages. So the initial intent was to have the book and the information, the curriculum designed for high schoolers. Um, we also have a K2, 3, 5, 6, 8 version that's coming out in January and June. But our initial intent was, was, was high schoolers and maybe first, second year college students. But what we discovered is something that's amazing. We found out that this textbook really engages all ages, like Joe uh, speaks of. It's important 
that we get this in the, in the hands of many people because integrated into this textbook, we believe that there's healing mechanisms that has the uh, propensity to really bring the world uh, together, especially this nation right here. Um, I know that Black Lives Matter, they do a great job with identifying what the challenges are, what the issues are, but we believe that we are solution oriented and we're really poised to really bring about um, a great deal of healing throughout America. Did you know when you started this project two years ago that you'd be doing, that you'd be using all these QR codes in the text because it, it allows you to use today's technology to they, because I was playing with it yesterday, actually, uh, <laughs> looking, looking at it. Is that something you originally set out to do or is that something that came along as you were moving forward with the idea? Yeah, we were very intentional about that. We wanted to make sure that we had a textbook that would be uh, considered a set apart from other textbooks. And we wanted to make sure that we had a strong integration of technology because many of our students are really positioned and poised to really have technology at, the, at their fingertips. So we wanted to uh, make sure that we provided a resource that would really increase and motivate them to be participatory in the project. In addition to the technology component, we have music um, that's really aligned with the textbook. We have a Grammy Award producer by the name of uh, Dr. Kevin K.O. Cates, and he's produced music for Jay-Z, T.I., Snoop Dogg, uh, Rick Ross, um, Drake, and, and other like. And so what he's done, he's taken the content of every unit, every chapter, and he's created songs based on that content. And so it's, it brings another rich, unique level to this, to this medium that we created. Dr. Freeman, did you, anything you wanted to share? Yes, the beauty of the music is that um, it's like an anthology of black history. Um, some people e even uh, looked at it because we have, you know, he starts uh, the music in ancient Africa. And of course, our book provides a gentle timeline from ancient Africa to modern times. Uh, the, the representative John Lewis passing away and George Floyd and all happening in our country right now. So it's ripping the headlines out of the newspaper and placing it in the textbook. And so he is, is providing this anthology following chapter by chapter, and it's just astonishing. The, the level of production, we, we've uh, uh, allowed some musicians to listen to the music, and one gentleman told me, he said, I made the mistake of starting to listen at 11 o'clock at night. I hardly got any sleep last night. <laughs> He's kind of uh, uh, happy, angry with me <laughs> the next day. But that's the power uh, of a, another gateway. So we, we want technology to be a gateway to history. Uh, we want music to be a gateway. The images are another form of music. You've got the words and the music in the textbook itself uh, so that the, the, the images draw people in. Plus, we have sidebars that are written in a different voice, uh, kind of a more catty voice. And then we have the elephant experience, which is designed to uh, help students wrestle with topics that have and questions that have vexed our country for centuries, but to do it in a way that is not at each other or past each other or yelling at each other, but or, or blocking each other on Facebook afterwards or calling <laughs> someone racist. It's the whole idea of really talking and and communicating. So we have a whole process that we've developed around that too. Okay, I've, I've, I have a couple of questions I want to get to, but you brought up in your answer, you've actually touched on two questions I have. Let, let me start, let me go to the easy one. Why, if this is supposed to be about American history, why would you start with, and I'm playing devil's advocate, okay, why would you start with Africa? That's a great question. Um, I think that one of the things that we wanted to do, we wanted to really fill this gap because this has been an ongoing question in terms of history. Um, we wanted to look at the ancient uh, civilizations and the connectivity that it has with uh, recent American history as well as contemporary times. Many uh, people um, in general, all people, really um, are not clear on the contributions that many uh, black people have made to world civilization as well as to this nation here. So we wanted to have a really strong foundation to bring that, uh, to bring that forth and to make that deep connection with um, the whole term African-American. And I think that once our young people see that they come from a, a rich legacy 
a legacy of, of, of commerce, a legacy of queendom and kingdom ships. Um, it really does something intrinsically to them and to motivate them to learn more and to do well academically, socially, and, um, and financially. And I'll, just to hitchhike on that, once people understand that the more folk ways, uh, the, the values, the genius, the creativity, the industry, the agriculture, the hunting, gathering, fishing, all of those things put together, and then the ancient African kingdoms that transcend the current geopolitical lines, now, now we're ready for the good, the bad, and the ugly of the last four centuries. And so it provides context, uh, we believe, and then, then the next unit we get into slavery and the slave trade. We uh, then move on, you know, uh, through to the Civil War, post-Civil War. Uh, we get into the Harlem Renaissance, the struggle for civil rights. And all of that now has, you, you, looking back through the lens of uh, ancient Africa, uh, now everything begins to make a whole lot more sense. And uh, so that's, that's the main reason we did that. I think you wanted to say something about the collection that you have. I know you've been involved in black history uh, for a long time, and I think you even wrote a, wrote a piece, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, about something about a, a white man in black history. What, <laughs> was, was that a book or a pamphlet, or what was that? <laughs> it's a, a book I wrote uh, called Return to Glory, and then I, uh, something I speak on called A White Man's Journey in Black History. But here, okay. the collection, Here's uh, one piece. This is from the mid 1800s from the Tukwe tribe of Angola. It's about 15, 16 inches long. And this is called a talking stick. And so here you see the, an image of the king and he has uh, what we could call a kalimba. You know, these, these instruments that you, you uh, play them like this. And he has this, this instrument in his hand. And uh, the reason why one historian told me is because uh, music is transcendent so it means that he is relevant he's at the top of the stick which he has pre preeminence but he is he is relevant to all generations and so the, the collection is over 3,000 pieces um, the oldest piece dates back to 1553 uh, we've done two exhibits at the United Nations well over a million people showed up for that ex those exhibits uh, we've done three in conjunction with the White House two in conjunction with uh, the Clinton Presidential Library, and about seven or eight with uh, Secret Service and just all other kinds, kinds of venues that you can imagine. And so uh, <clears throat> being able, able to identify over 4,000 images from the collection gave us a tremendous pool to draw from so that when we were putting together the, the imagery, uh, we weren't beholden to other companies that they want options in your firstborn children. Because any, anyone who's in the textbook industry uh, uh, lets us know that the number one budget for development of any textbook is images. And then they want options in your firstborn children every two years, and it just gets crazy. So um, <laughs> we were able to uh, have the images in-house, uh, a bulk, a, a large number of images in-house, which allowed this, this pro project to be able to um, uh, be unique, because many of the images I've looked online, I can't find them anywhere else except in the textbook. So is, that part of, by that. so is that part of the Freeman Institute? Yes. So is it, okay. Now, and I, I, I will, I've, I've kind of brought everything under a Black uh, History 365. So okay. uh, Walter and I, we're, we're, this is now our total focus. One of the last questions I want to ask you, and I'm hoping maybe to get in one more, but this may be it. How do you stay away from the politics? Because uh, you, you know conservatives and liberals see the world and its problems and solutions a little bit differently. So. Uh, do you try and stay away from that? Is that one of those places where you have people put together their own, you know, do their own research and come out with their own understanding, you know, as they're, as they're looking to answer, trying to answer questions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and Joel and I talk about that all the time because we are human and we have our, our views, so to speak. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure, and we talked about the structure of this even before we started. And one of the things that we wanted to really bring forth is a great deal of integrity. And what I mean by that is that you have two schools of thoughts usually. You have the Eurocentric school of thought and you have the Afrocentric school of thought. We wanted to make sure that we stayed within the realms of what is called truth-centric. 
making sure that we dealt with things uh, from a critical um, analysis standpoint, but that we were really honest. We dealt with the good, the bad, and the ugly. And one of the things in the book, we have something called the elephant experience, where we deal with those incredibly tough topics and we give people the skill sets to really deal with that and communicate with those tough things effectively. And we believe that all of those are components to this whole um, goal of us being agents to heal, to bring about healing. Dr. Freeman, you have 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, we have four things, uh, become critical thinkers, compassionate listeners, fact-based, respectful communicators, and action-oriented solutionists. That's one thing that everyone on the right and the left, up, down, all around can agree on. And that's our goal, uh, to engage people and invite people to those four things. Well, look, I, I appreciate you, what you've done. Um, we joked about you're having a pocket edition <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it's a huge tome. Uh, I've loved looking through it. The images are incredible and the, um, uh, the technology is wonderful as well. Um, uh, a plug for the book, we do have access to it. We are an affiliate. Freedom Journal Institute is actually an affiliate. If you go to our website and go to Freedom Journal Institute and go under uh, community, you'll actually find a link to where you can look, at, look more at the book. Go to the, it will take, send you to the website and you can order from there. There's a certain amount of the proceeds will go to our nonprofit organization. Uh, again, I wanna thank you gentlemen for being with us. Uh, pleasure to have you and hopefully have you back soon. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment. Never before in America's history has there been a more desperate need for a unified voice to fight against the moral decay of our nation. Liberal progressives are pushing an agenda to destroy Judeo-Christian values and mainstream media and other institutions are promoting the depravity of our nation. At Freedom's Journal Institute, we stand with those who are becoming marginalized simply because of their biblical faith and values. Like you, we are troubled by the racial and political unrest in our society. With the launch of our new online community, the Alliance of Freedom Fighters, we have risen to the challenge in the battle for life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. When you join our community, you will get access to FJI's digital libraries, and information sharing portals, the ability to collaborate with other Alliance Freedom Fighters on both national and local community projects and issues, as well as needed support, encouragement, and best practices to champion our shared ideas and values. Go to allianceoffreedomfighters.com and become a part of the Alliance. Welcome back. Someone once asked the black pastor, what was more critical, identifying as a black man or as a Christian? He answered, I was born black. His answer insinuated that his identifying as a black man was of utmost importance. And I would agree that knowing who we are, our ancestry, lineage, family, and pedigree are essential. The Bible, especially the Old Testament, implores Israel to remember their beginnings. Exodus 13, three says, unquote, then Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the land of slavery. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten, end quote. Thus the Passover was established to remember how the Lord delivered Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians. Israel is also told to remember their bondage in Egypt, that the Lord commands them to rest on the Sabbath, that this command applies to the Jewish people, their sons, their daughters, their servants, and their beasts, or beasts of burden. Why? Quote, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day, end quote. It's Deuteronomy 5.15. In fact, Moses calls on the people of Israel to remember at least 12 times in Deuteronomy's book as Israel is about to enter the land of promise. Throughout the biblical text, we are called upon to remember. We are also warned what happens should people forget the Lord. Deuteronomy 8 clearly warns Israel that they do not forget the Lord because they have, quote, eaten and are full, quote, build good houses and live in them and that your herds, flocks, silver, and gold have multiplied. That's chapter eight, verses 12 through 13. 
Verses 14 through 15 repeat the history of God's deliverance from slavery. However, the warning is in verses 19 through 20, quote, if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today, you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God, end quote. Thus, Israel's call to remember isn't just about national identity or ethnic identity, but a call to remember and worship the one who created them. There is an assumption that we have been taught what we should remember in the call to remember. In other words, we can't remember what we've never been taught. The Black History 365 is an excellent resource for filling in the gaps of a history that has not been fully taught or accurately taught. However, it cannot be a substitute or a replacement for our history as the people created in the God's image and likeness in Genesis 1, or that we are descendants of Abraham and Noah. And as in Acts 17, 24 through 27, quote, the Lord who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, end quote. Thus, even though I am born as a black man, as a Christian, I am born again. My second birth supersedes my first birth. According to Paul in Galatians 3, 27 through 29, it says, quote, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise, end quote. Thus, to place my identity as a black man ahead of my identity as a Christian subordinates the work of Christ to the appearance of my flesh. This is idolatry. Yes, we must know our history as an ethnic group and as the people of God, the faith community. Black history should not divide us, but unite us understanding that God created all of us in his image and likeness as part of his tapestry, the tapestry of human similarities and differences that we celebrate but subordinate to our identity as children of God. Now, to get a copy of Black History 365, go to our website and hover over the community tab, and a menu will drop down listing Black History 365. Click on that, and it will take you to a page with more information and a chance to order a copy. Part of the proceeds will come to Freedom's Journal Institute. And until next time, God bless.